Hi guys, welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be discussing tests of controls as well as substantive procedures. So let's get into it. So in order to recap, you know, where are we exactly in the audit stages? So we've now accepted the, the engagement. We have done our risk assessment. So we've tried to understand the entity, the environment in which it operates, as well as the internal controls that are, are there in that company or in that entity that are relevant to our work as auditors. And now we've assessed these risks and we then need to respond, right? So we are now part of, or in the risk response stage of the audit and how you respond to those risks is basically how you're going to gather your audit evidence so that you can support your audit opinion right so obtain this audit evidence by means of uh, tests of controls as well as substantive procedures now what is uh, or how do i know which one we're talking about it's not always easy but I think a nice summary or something for you to remember is that with a test of control, you're essentially confirming that the process is as described. And then with a substantive procedure, that's where you're now trying to confirm the RAND value um, of the items as shown in your financial statements. So when you're performing the tests of controls or trying to confirm that the process works as management has described for you, right? You would um, inspect certain things, you would observe um, how they do things, you could make inquiries, and you may, to a limited extent, um, also reperform some things. And then with your substantive procedures, when you're trying to confirm the rank value of the items as um, shown in your Fs, you would recalculate, you would reperform, you would observe to a limited extent. So for example, if you think about an inventory count, you'd go and observe um, how that is done to gain comfort over the fact that the the, the the number that is shown as inventory at your end is actually accurate, right? You would also inspect, externally confirm, reperform, uh, perform analytical procedures and also make inquiries in that trip. So from an exam technique perspective, your tests of controls will be properly described if they follow the HWW or how, what, why approach. So how speaking to what exactly are you doing? So are you inspecting? Are you inquiring? Are you observing? What refers to the source document that you're going to be looking at or the process that you're trying to um, understand or trying to test? And then the why speaks to the reason. So why are you actually doing this to begin with? So as far as exam technique goes, it really does depend on which um, system description you're getting or which cycle you'll be getting in your exam. Uh, but it goes without saying that you need to only focus on testing the controls that have been described for you in the question because you cannot test what, you know, you, you can't test something that doesn't exist or something that isn't there. So when you now test, you, you will be um, fully informed by what the question says and then you take it from there. And then second and most importantly, please make sure you follow the HWW. So how are you doing this test? What are you doing? And why are you doing it? If you do this, you are guaranteed to basically get the marks. Now, if you think about substantive procedures, right? So with this types of procedures, we're trying to essentially confirm the RAND value um, that is shown um, in your financial statements. So if we say that um, expenditure was a million rand, you would then be trying to establish if that million rand is actually correct. The bad news about substantive procedures is that it can't be taught to you because there will be as many substantive procedures as there are line items in the financial statement. So I cannot make a video on every single line item in the Fs. It's something that you will need to learn. You know, the more you do the questions, though, the, 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 the more you realize, like, you know, what works and what doesn't. If they say to you that this question, uh, they've already performed the general um, procedures for you, then you know that your lecturer really has something against you. But if they've said nothing, always, always remember to start with your general procedures. What, 
So general procedures, what are those? So that would include things such as getting a management rep letter with regard to um, all assertions or whichever assertion you've been asked to test. Um, that would include getting the schedule, costing the schedule, agreeing the balance of the schedule to the GL, to the TB, to the Fs, um, inspecting the schedule for any um, unusual items and following up on that. Um, other things might include inspecting the financial statements for just general disclosure on that particular item or um, yes, that particular item to see if it's been properly presented. And you may also do some general um, analytical kind of procedures or, or relationship testing. So where you, um, you know, compare the, the, the percentage of revenue, say, to debtors or whatever other relevant um, example of an analytical procedure that you may find so you need to find something that's relevant in order to get the marks and i'd say maybe if you do about two or three of those just to be safe so that would you know in summary be your general type of procedure so never ever forget this it's always the same um, even up until itc level you can still be able to get marks just by wording um, your general procedures um, the way i have so i think the more questions you see with this the better you become at it. Um, so I'd really, really encourage you to see uh, some additional questions on what you can do here. Why do students generally struggle with substantive procedures? I think, you know, it goes back to well, most of us really don't know what we're doing <laughs> until you've actually done the actual audit. Um, so half the time we're just trying to maximize um, us getting marks and we don't really understand what we're trying to do. The other problem is that students see the entire balance as something to be audited. What they don't um, appreciate, for example, when you're auditing the statement of financial position is that the item that you see on the face is effectively a closing balance. You cannot audit that thing. But by auditing the opening balance and then auditing that against, um, you know, um, last year's audited Fs, has it been properly brought forward? That's how you confirm the opening balance. And then you're also going to audit the movement of the of that line item. So if you think about something like, say, PPE, you're going to have the opening balance for PPE. You're going to have any additions uh, that we bought in the current year, any, you know, less any disposals, uh, less any uh, depreciation and payment, plus minus revals, depending on the um, on the model that you've chosen so there are just too many or rather there are multiple factors at play with regard to how we get to that final closing balance and as soon as you break up the balance into those different components you then see that it's 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 much more easier for example to generate your substantive procedures so if you now have to do work on additions you might think that okay fine there's probably an invoice for this thing i just want to see the invoice i want to see the value at which it was carried through was that properly taken into account um did we depreciate the item, for example, um, proportionately based on how long we've had the asset? Um, were there any other additional items at play in bringing um, the asset to uh, its intended stage of, of usage? I'm not even sure if I'm using the correct terminology, but I think you get what I mean. So did we incur like any um, additional costs after we bought the item to actually get it to a usable um, state. That's the things that you should be auditing. With regard to depreciation, you may want to, for example, inspect the policy as to how these types of assets need to be depreciated. And then you might then do the calculation yourself. So compare your own calculation with what management has done. For disposals, you may want to um, go and inspect, um, for example, the approval process for you know the meeting at which it was discussed that we actually need to dispose of these assets. So was that disposal properly authorized and then in doing that you may check for um you know did we actually receive money you know in the bank statement for this assets because if you receive money for it it then makes sense that it should be um, um then removed and then you may check for um a whole lot of factors depending on um on the information that you have at hand but 
what I'm trying to demonstrate is that as soon as you break up the balance into smaller manageable chunks, it then becomes easier for you to formulate substantive procedures as opposed to just seeing the 1 billion uh, PPE line item and then you're trying to audit that. You're not going to succeed. So my tip would be for you to try and break it up, uh, see what other things are there, um, and then try and audit those individual things um, individually. Like I said earlier, it's not possible for me to, um, you know, discuss every single line item. Otherwise, this video would be, I don't know, 24 hours long. Uh, but I'm just trying to teach you a principle so that you're able to apply it um, in any kind of setup. So what I would encourage you to do is to look at different types of questions or questions that test uh, different line items. So constantly challenge yourself uh, by doing line items that uh, you haven't seen before. I actually did, um, you know, go through the, the ITC, um, previous ITC papers, just to check the kind of stuff that they've asked on. And I did make a note of ones that I think you should definitely go and look at. And they are uh, the January 2020 ITC paper two, question one, had a substantive uh, procedures question on payroll that's a really nice one and then uh january 2020 as well paper four question one had a substantive procedures question on the loyalty program liability now that should be interesting january 20 uh, 2019 paper four question one um, had a nice question on disposal of investment in a sub now the nice thing about this particular question is that it also uh, you're also going to learn how to do substantive procedures on Companies Act type questions. Because if you think about this, like a disposal of a sub, uh, depending on um, how big the, 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 the investment is, it may trigger like additional um, or it may trigger Section 1112 of the Companies Act, if I'm not mistaken. So you may need to, to, to check uh, compliance with that particular um, um, section in the Companies Act. So you'd look at things such as, um, for example, how would you determine if there was a director's resolution, if there was a special resolution, if you had to audit that substantively, what exactly would you be looking for? So I'd really encourage you guys to look at this question. It was a really good one. And then the November 2020 um, ITC paper for question one had a substantive procedures question on management fees. Now, this is just the little that I had um, checked. Uh, please try these, look at them, try and audit them, uh, and then also find additional ones that you, you think are interesting. If you do find, please put it in the comment below so that other students can also go and, and look for these questions and also practice. But essentially, the more you practice, the better you become at this. So I'd really encourage you guys to just, you know, put in that extra amount of effort and just think about what it is exactly that you're trying to do here. You're trying to confirm the RAND value um, of this thing that you're seeing in your app. So should that RAND value be actually um, what is shown uh, to us by management? That's essentially what you're trying to do. Now, how do you write your substantive procedures in such a way that the examiner actually gets a warm, fuzzy feeling that you actually understand what you're doing? I would again advise you to still follow the HWW approach. So how are you doing this? What are you doing? What is the reason for it? So the manner in which you write will be more or less the same as how you would write your test of controls. It must always be as descriptive as possible and the reason why you do this is that it needs to, um, if someone else was to come and pick up your working paper now in practice, pick up your working paper, they would need to be able to go and do exactly what you've described, right? And come to more or less the same conclusion based on how you've done the test. So if you're not being descriptive, how would another person then know what it is exactly that you're trying to do? So practice as many questions as you can. Um, follow the HWW. Um, and I think if you do that, you should be. I do apologize if you're expecting me to have some miracle tip on how to actually get substantive procedures, right? It's just one of those things that you get by practicing and by also seeing where the marks lie. So again, do not ever forget 
general procedures. And after you've then written your general procedures, just sit down and think about what goes or what kind of elements goes into this final figure that I then see um, in my financial statements. And how am I going to um, audit the different components in a manner that actually makes sense? So in a manner that gives me comfort that that number that has been shown is actually um, what should be shown. I hope you found this video um, helpful. Please do feel free to email me if you have any additional questions or if you have um, any suggestions as to the topic that I need to cover. My email address is actually in the description box below. See you guys next time. Thank you so much for watching.